everyone. Welcome to the British Library. Um, tonight to all of you here and everyone watching wherever you are all around the world online. My name is Tanya Kirk and I'm the lead curator of our current exhibition, Fantasy Realms of Imagination. Um, we're absolutely delighted to be hosting this event this evening, uh, which accompanies the exhibition, and we're thrilled that the authors Tamsin Muir, Samantha Shannon and Tasha Suri have been able to be here in person, with TJ Clune joining us on, li on live on screen all the way from Denver, Colorado. Uh, they'll be in conversation with our host Mendez, of which more in a moment. Um, just to give you a little background on the exhibition, it's uh, an exploration of the whole of the genre of fantasy from its earliest roots in older forms of storytelling right up to the present day. And we've tried to show how it's kind of gone beyond the written word and is kind of kept incredibly vibrant through different uh, media like film, TV, costumes, props, uh, artwork, music, uh, and loads of fan culture and gaming as well. Um, it's just running at the library till 25th of February, so we're in the last few weeks now, um, and it's selling out the weekend, so uh, there's only a short time to come if you haven't been already, but please do. Uh, at the end of the conversation, you're very welcome to put your questions to the panel. Those watching online, you can submit questions using the form, which appears below the video window at any point, and we'll read out a selection of the best later on in the event tonight. And if you'd like to buy a related book, there's a great selection to be found via the books tab at the top of the screen. Those of you here in the auditorium can, of course, come to the bookstall outside, where our writers will be stopping to sign books after the event. Um, and it just leaves me to introduce tonight's chair, Mendez, who is an author, screenwriter and critic. Their first novel, Rainbow Milk, was named one of the Observer's top 10 best debuts for 2020 and was shortlisted for numerous prizes. And they're currently working on adapting Rainbow Milk for a TV series and working on their second novel. Uh, I'm absolutely delighted to welcome our speakers to the stage. Thanks. Good evening, everyone. Um, welcome to our queer fantasy event here at the British Library. Um, so, uh, my name is Mendez. Thank you so much for the introduction. Wherever you are, you disappeared. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, yeah, so I'd like to welcome our panelists this evening. Um, so, I will go through um, in order of uh, from nearest to me. Um, so, Tamsin Muir is the. <laughs> doesn't need an introduction. <laughs> <laughs> is the award-winning author of the books of Amber Duology. No, that's not me. That's not me. Oh, sorry, I'm reading. <laughs> I could be. I wish. I left my glasses back there, sorry. Uh, <laughs> Time Zimmer is the author of the Lock Tomb series, uh, which begins with Gideon the Ninth, continues with Harrow the Ninth, and Nona the Ninth, and concludes with Electo the Ninth. Hopefully. <laughs> Do you think these people will let you not bring <laughs> Electra? Oh, I should have gone online. <laughs> Her short fiction has been nominated for the Nebula Award, the Shirley Jackson Award, the World Fantasy Award, and the UG Foster Memorial Award. A Kiwi, she has spent most of her life in Howick, New Zealand. Sorry about the pronunciation, if that wasn't oh, correct. That's fine. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, with time living in Waiuku and central Wellington. She currently lives and works in Oxford here in the UK. Next up, and uh, someone who had a little interpret... Oh, no, sorry, next up is uh, the person on the street. <laughs> Shall I just leave and come back? Start again. <laughs> This is so, going so well, I'm excited. <laughs> yeah, so I, I, I'm really confused because the sound is coming from somewhere, but I can see you speaking on screen. So uh, TJ Kloon. is the New York Times and USA Today best-selling Lambda Literary Award winning author of The House in the Cerulean Sea, Under the Whispering Door, in the Lives of Puppets and the Green Creek series for adults, which began with Wolf Song, and also the Extraordinary series for teens and more. Uh, and we're welcoming TJ from Denver, Colorado today. Yeah, sorry guys, I'm in a hotel room on a tour for, for my book here in the States, so I apologize for the background here, but thank you for having me. I'm very excited to be here. Well, we love it. 
Uh, Tasha Suri is the... <laughs> is the award-winning author of the Books of Amber. Is that correct yeah. pronunciation? <laughs> <laughs> Duology, uh, the Burning Kingdoms trilogy, uh, which includes the Jasmine Throne, the Oleander Sword, and the forthcoming, the Lotus Kingdom, and what souls are made of. She has won the best newcomer, Sydney J. Bounds, from the British Fantasy Society, and the World Fantasy Award for Best Novel. Her debut novel, Empire of Sand, was named one of the 100 best fantasy books of all time by Time Magazine. That is incredible. And Samantha Shannon. <laughs> Samantha Shannon is the New York Times and Sunday Times bestselling author of the mercurial and multi-stranded dystopian fantasy series, The Bone Season. Uh -oh. <laughs> I didn't write this. <laughs> Her 2019 novel, The Priory of the Orange Tree, was her first outside of the Bone Season series and was a New York Times bestseller and was recently followed by the prequel, A Day of Fallen Night. Uh, so join me again in welcoming our panel. Um, so I just want to start by asking a very general question of the whole panel, um, so feel free to chip in. Um, what were your formative influences and what brought you into SFF or fantasy, like however you would describe the genre you work in? Great question. <laughs> Can I say anime or...? Mm? No, no, say it, say it, please. Anime. <laughs> yes. Uh, but I grew up in that in that um, halcyon time where you could only get like um, three animes, and I think it was like Pokemon, uh, Dragon Ball Z, and Sailor Moon. And Sailor Moon was the one for me. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it was also sort of my first introduction to queer love stories, even though they were cousins, you know I cousins. think, in the dark. <laughs> yeah. So it was it was a slightly different vibe going on, but. Um, <laughs> Yeah. You're going to have to explain this to me later. <laughs> I, I can explain it now. <laughs> um, <laughs> so it was, so this was, so Sailor Moon was a Japanese anime, obviously that's a tautology, but anyway, um, and there were two characters in it who were in love in the original, right? Uh -huh. But when they brought it to the UK and to the West in general, they were like, oh no, we can't have two women in love with each other. Oh my God. So I what thought... if we just make them cousins because that will make it less obvious. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you meant that the cousins were gay. I mean, in a sense, yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> I understand now. Thank you. Mm, anytime. <laughs> <laughs> Shall well, I go? You know what? I'll, I'll interrupt that here. Um, the the. I also wanted to be Sailor Moon when I was a child, um, but I, I did want to say that that for me the the most defining. Uh, influence that I can think of was probably the very first time I read Howl's Moving Castle by Diana Wynne Jones. Um, that that changed me in ways that I was not expecting because I, I did not know that fiction could make you feel like that. I did not know that you could go on an adventure like that and everything would be okay at the end. And it just, it made me feel, I don't know, maybe it made me feel more powerful than I'd ever felt before in my life. Because as a queer kid, you always have this sense of otherness about you, you in ways that doesn't allow you to relate to your peers so when you find something that makes you feel happy and when you find something that makes you feel seen or whole it's something that you latch on to and i have I, I have read howl's moving castle probably a good dozen times since then and i'll, I'll continue to read it because it, I, it reminds me of how i felt when i was a kid first discovering fiction that made me feel like i could do something with myself Wonderful, thank you. I mean, that was such a sincere answer. I don't know how to say anything after that. Because, <laughs> I mean, video games for me. Um, Final Fantasy was such a huge... In yep, thank you, one person, yeah. <laughs> it's us. Um, yeah, I mean, JRPGs in general had such a massive influence on me, although this ages me a little bit. I also really love the works of Taya Applegate, Animorphs. Um, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, as a kid, you know, they're incredibly dark books, and for me, they really 
taught me that, you know, you can read a book, a fantasy, a sci-fi book, and it can be for young adults or whatever, and it can be incredibly rough. Those books were dark as. They should have come with, like, some kind of sticker on the cover. They traumatized me. Seriously. <laughs> they they died. The characters in that the series died, they like, all, died. all the time. Spoiler. All the time. <laughs> yeah, nobody's safe in that book. Everybody's dead by the end. Mm -hmm. It was an influence. <laughs> <laughs> The looks of horror in the audience. <laughs> <laughs> oh, they know what they got into. <laughs> they've read it. They've read it. So I, I think, weirdly, I mostly read contemporary fiction when I was a kid. So I was big Jacqueline Wilson girl. Yeah. High, high amounts of trauma. Yeah. I'm, I met Jacqueline Wilson recently and I had to really resist being like, thanks for the trauma, Jacqueline. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then I saw the Lord of the Rings um, film adaptation when I was about 10, which is when The Fellowship of the Ring came out. And I remember I rushed to the shop because, you know, the book is always better, right? So I got my dad to take me to the shop. And I really wanted to see that bit where Arwen goes against the Nazgul because I thought that was the <laughs> coolest thing I've ever seen. Also, I thought I wanted to be Arwen and then later realised that actually I had a crush on Liv Tyler. Uh, not something I realised until later in life. <laughs> um, so yeah, so then I, I went to the book and I was rushing to read that particular scene and I realised in the book Arwen doesn't do that. It's a male elf who does it. And that kind of broke my heart and I didn't read fantasy for quite a long time. <laughs> I, was, I have a really rocky relationship with Tolkien. Um, I, I did also love The Hobbit when I was a kid, I should say. Um, and then basically um, I didn't read fantasy for a while I went back to reading my contemporary and then I picked up Garth Nix, uh, Sabriel, mm. um, which, and by the way, Garth Nix is so lovely, like it's like that really, that I, was, I was so scared when I met him because he was one of my huge heroes when I was a kid and he's just a really, really lovely man, which always really helps. But yeah, so Sabriel was my sort of gateway back into fantasy and then I never really stopped reading it after that. Like before that, I was like Jacqueline Wilson, um, Mallory Blackman, like there was just loads of contemporary authors and then suddenly Garth Nix <laughs> and then I never stopped. <laughs> Um, my, um, if anyone's wondering what I'm here for, <laughs> um, I, um, does anyone remember a film called The Blob? Like, no one remembers. Yes. It, but it was, okay, right. So, um, I actually started writing at the age of six. My first story was a fan fiction of The Blob. <laughs> I love this so much. So yeah. Wow. So good. Yeah. I love um, this view. <laughs> uh, it's now sadly lost. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, now I have to know, did any of the rest of you write fan fiction too? Well, this is... Because this if, if need be, like that, I can go into great and graphic detail about my 13-year-old version of X-Files slash fiction because I was <laughs> and Fox Mulder. Wait, I who, actually, who are you shipping I, I in X-Files? Wrote, Fo Fox Mulder and Agent Skinner. Oh, fair enough, yeah. 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 Old yeah, school. Yeah, yeah, yeah when... In, when my extraordinary series, my YA series about uh, fan fiction, about a kid who loves to run faction, fan fiction, I lifted wholesale my old fan fiction <laughs> and put it in the book. So when you see something like Shadow Star growled seductively, that used to be Walter Skinner growled seductively. Nice. There you go. Any aspiring writers, great advice. Never throw anything away because you never know when it will come in handy next. It's correct. Um, speaking of fan fiction, um, <laughs> Why is everyone laughing at everything I say? <laughs> uh, time's in. Um, is, is that... Why am I first? I don't know. I am not being shady. <laughs> Stop it. Um, so you started, uh, or you came, you, is it fair to say you come from a fan fiction background as well, and, and that's where you started? That might be true to say. Um, so it has a kind of, I don't know, um, I want to debunk the, um, the snobbishness around fan fiction because I think it's a very, we both can, all, all three of us can attest, it's a great place to start writing. Um, <laughs> what? Um, but is the poo-pooing of it yet another example of queerphobia, um, seeing as fan fiction is often a creative refuge for queer young writers? Oh, undoubtedly. I think that it's absolutely conflated with you know, queer fiction, obviously not all fan fiction is gay, but you know, it has that kind of snide little slimy, like, ooh, I bet you write gay people. And I mean, you know, it used to be more explicit. I remember the old, uh, not so halcyon days when, you know, there used to be kind of militant little bands of other teenagers being like, we don't want any yowie. 
you know. <laughs> you haven't lived until you've seen, you know, Sailor Moon, like, uh, advertising, and no Yowie Webring. Um, that, that just dated me so hard. You just, <laughs> you just dated me as well. Oh, good. Because <laughs> I, I just aged, you know, on, on stage. Um, but, yeah, I think that it is undoubtedly queer phobia. Um, I think that, you know, we talked about this earlier, but, you know, a way to slam on teenage girls mm. really, really hard, just from outer space. And I don't think that fan fiction has lost that stigma. So I think it is ongoing queer phobia, and mm. it sucks. Mm. Um, you know, it just, it is what it is, but I don't see it getting any better, and I was so hopeful. Mm. You know, we are sitting here talking about the fan fiction we used to write about the blob and, you know, just <laughs> Skinner, really? With, you know. <laughs> and, you know... I have uh, daddy issues. And so yeah. <laughs> Same. Yeah. <laughs> I don't. Same. Um, <laughs> <laughs> TJ, tell me, did but you feel a little kind of like a little bit of shame or have you shed that? No, not at all. Because my first stories that I wrote, I when I was a kid, I learned that things that could bring me joy were things that could be taken away from me. I, I had a family who was not uh, proud to have me as a child. So what I did was I did I wrote in secret. I read in secret. I got made fun of for writing. I got made fun of for reading by my parents. And so when I did start writing, it was always in secret at night under the cover, like the whole cliche of having a flashlight under your comforter while it's over your head. That's what I was doing when I was writing. And my first bit of writing that I ever did was based on the video game Metroid, because I was blown away. The six-year-old version of me was blown away that at the very end of the video game Metroid, when you take off, that you've been fighting this alien, you have a gun for an arm, you're a badass space marine, and then when you take off your helmet at the end of the game, you realize that you've been playing as a woman the whole time. Her name is Samus, and she was amazing, so much so that I would start writing stories about me and Samus going around and defeating aliens. And I remember the day that I got discovered doing that. It was seven years old, and my stepfather found the notebook of the stories that I wrote in there. And he took those out to the burn barrel and burned them right in front of me. And that is the kind of thing that I think we think of when it comes to fan fiction. We think of how it's somehow lesser, that it's somehow not as good. But the thing is, fan fiction not only is a valid form of literature, but it also helps young writers find their voice. They don't have to worry about creating these entire worlds, they can take existing worlds and put their own mark on them and that helps them find their voice. And as it was mentioned previously, the queer aspect of fan fiction has always been there. It will always be there. And it is a safe place for young queer writers who don't get to see themselves in canon events that they want to be able to explore and, and show themselves how they would react in a story like that. So whenever I hear the literati going down on fan fiction and talking about how awful it is, it's just, you don't know the people that you're denigrating when you say stuff like that. You don't know the harm that you could cause. You may cause a writer who has the biggest dreams of becoming a big time selling author. You may cause them to quit because you don't think what they're doing is good enough. So not that I'm in fan fiction at all, obviously. Um, <laughs> it, a lot of us um, who are a similar age to me grew up under section 28 where you couldn't talk about or approve of queerness in a school environment which meant that there were a lot of people who were queer in some sense whether on an axis of gender or sexuality who were bullied and got no defense from any adult and I know what that felt like and it sucked and it also meant you couldn't find books about queerness so fan fiction was one of the only places you could go to where there was any kind of queer representation but what I found recently really empowering was um Somebody did some work online about the history of fan fiction and they talked about Kirk and Spock, right? And there was a really interesting interview saved from the, like the 1970s with this lady who was a teacher in the UK. And she had been involved with zines, so Kirk and Spock zines. Um, explicit, you know, smutty zines that she and friends had made and printed and sent to each other. It was illegal because it was obscene content. So, um, and some kind of fandom spat. <laughs> somebody had told customs about this this scene you can find these this this oh. interview online and she basically got called in by customs um and had to explain it and they looked at this little lady who was a teacher in a cardigan and were just like i don't think you know what you were sent my darling and she went no 
I don't know. <laughs> oh, <it's> just... <laughs> and, and I think, and, and I love that story because it was really funny, but it also reminded me that, you know, for a lot of us in, in various parts of the world, in various families, um, writing queer fiction is a radical act and sometimes reaching published material or reaching publication is, is not something we can do and not necessarily something we want. Mm -hmm. And in the end, writing, whether it's in fan fiction or published, is an act of creation, both of yourself and of art, because you make something of yourself in writing. And I know that sounds really like up myself, I guess, but that's kind of how it feels, right, when you make something. And I think that's important to remember when we talk about queer writing and queer art. Mm. I wanted to ask you as well, Tasha, um, I think I read in an interview that um, you started reading SFF after mm. your first book came out. Is that no, correct? No, 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 that's not true. <laughs> okay. Well, stop that. <laughs> um, but like, so, but anyway, like, does anyone feel like they've sort of experienced a change in their reading and writing habits since publication? Hmm. I'm not sure. I think. I no, I still read yeah. and write weird crap all the time. <laughs> That's how it is. I read a. I read a book. Uh, Things have gotten worse since we last spoke. It's a horror novel that came out last year and it's basically about two women who form an online relationship and then try to kill each other and it is weird and wonderful and that's the kind of book i love to read i just, just have to read the what you like i think i probably read more queer fiction since i published the priory of the orange tree mm. um, because that book was very formative for me in that i figured out i was gay while i was writing it ah. <laughs> um, i remember i got a message once and somebody was like i didn't realize how gay i was until i read the priory of the orange tree and i said i didn't realize how gay i was until I read the <laughs> <laughs> um, and it was weird because it kind of, it, it's strange because I had always felt very unlike my straight friends. You know, my, I remember when I was so sort of in my early teens and my friends all started talking about boys and I thought that was about the most boring subject on earth. No offence to any men in the audience. Um, <laughs> but I just, I was just really constantly frustrated with it and I wasn't really sure why. But I never considered the idea that I might be gay because it just wasn't, you know, the default setting in my head was straight. And to be gay was this thing that I just, I didn't know any gay, well I probably did know gay people but no one who was out as gay. Um, so when I wrote The Priory of the Orange Tree and I realised, oh, that, that might have been something, something might have been going on there for sure. <laughs> and it was like it unlocked like this part of myself both as like a writer in which like suddenly I just wanted to tell all these like queer stories and I was imagining all the, these love stories between women. Um, and it definitely made me reassess my, my kind of early life in some ways, like I said, with the crush on Liv Tyler, where I definitely didn't realise that was a crush and it definitely was. <laughs> um, and yeah, but then suddenly, of course, once I started writing it I wanted to read it as well so I think mm. yeah now I read like a lot of queer fiction in a way that I just didn't really in I, I did I did read some before I published Priory for sure but mm. like in my younger years I just I just didn't mm. so you both have in common the um almost feminist retelling of of history and of myths yeah. I think with the Priory of the Orange Tree certainly the George and Dragon uh, George St George and the Dragon story a yes. feminist retelling of that um, I know you've spoken about like your sort of um, becoming story as a person whilst writing that, but what compelled you to to want to retell this sort of ancient myth as as in, in through a feminist lens? Um, well, I was raised Christian, so I grew up in the Church of England, um, and I also went to like Rainbows, Brownies, Guides, the whole trilogy. Um, so, you know, George and the Dragon was a big thing, because he's obviously the patron saint of England and a Christian saint, therefore in the Church of England he's a pretty prominent figure. Um, and of course it's the ultimate tale of the damsel in distress, and I was always asking myself, well, who was the princess in that story? And I decided, um, when I had a gap in the Bone Season series, I decided to research this, the, the legend of St George and where it had come from. Um, and it's always kind of fascinated me because it's on one side presented as a tale of like heroism about this kind of brave knight saving a lady from a dragon. But then it's also used by nationalists um, to basically talk about this kind of idea of Englishness and mm. whiteness and to uphold that. Like every St. George's Day, you, whenever you're on Twitter, you would always see just awful things, you mm. know, about how great St. George is. And I decided to see if that, if that had any basis in the original legend. And it very much does. Like there's multiple versions of the story that are very ugly and problematic. I took this particular version of the story from 1596, uh, which is by an Elizabethan writer called Richard Johnson, 
And he was, I think, like the source of the idea of George as this kind of white English figure, basically. And I f there was a lot of hatred in that story. And I felt like I wanted to take that and deconstruct it and do something with it and make it feminist and make it about people from different religions and backgrounds coming together to defeat a common threat. Um, so I basically, in that version of the story, there's... Um, an orange tree that St. George fights the dragon under. And I decided I wanted to take the orange tree out of that story and give it to a bunch of women <laughs> instead. And then I decided that I wanted to make it a love story between two women because I wanted to base it partly on the Elizabethan era. And I was reading this, um, this novel about Elizabeth's relationship with her ladies of the bedchamber. And I remember there was this line and it was like, it was very common for people to share a bed with a person of the same sex. And it was mm -hmm. really emphasised of how extremely straight this was. <laughs> 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 and I was like, hmm, but what if it wasn't? <laughs> so I decided to, I thought that was a really interesting dynamic, so I decided to use that as the basis of a, a lesbian love story and it all just kind of went from there, really. So it was me having beef with a man who has been dead for 400 years. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Um, and Tasha, um, the Jasmine throne mm -hmm. um, is concerned with power, the abuse of power, um, empire and subjugation and also features uh, a love story between two women. Um, were these overarching themes that you started out uh, with wanting to write into, or did they emerge as the um, story you wanted to tell played out? I think, I think they be it was definitely intentional to make it feminist mm. and sapphic. That was the intention from the start. So um, I was drawing on a lot of the, the religio kind of mythology that I grew up with. So I grew up Hindu, I'm still Hindu. Um, and a lot of the kind of the big epics contain women, but they're not having a terribly good time, um, which is true of a lot of mythology and a lot of religion, I think, broadly. But I wanted to work with what was familiar to me. Um, so there is stuff about, uh, broadly, um, without going into a lot of detail, things about, you know, women's purity, what makes a woman pure, what does a righteous woman do? Um, and there is one story of a particular woman um, who is shamed in front of a court and she takes down her hair and she says, I will not tie my hair up again until I bathe it in the blood of the men who did this to me, essentially. Oh. Which was very metal, but I kind of wanted her <laughs> to do the killing, which she didn't get to do. Um, and I thought, and I, was, I, I wanted to explore what women's power looked like historically within a South Asian subcontinent-ish context. Um, and also look at how it look, could have looked mythologically, mm. which meant writing a story set in a patriarchy, mm. um, which I think was fun for me, quite traumatising to read, possibly. Um, but I think there are kind of two broad approaches in SFF. Um, one, which is queer norm, where we say, the world probably sucks in many ways, but being queer is not a problem. Mm. It sucks in all these other ways. Mm. Um, and then there are ones where um, the world sucks in many ways, but also it's queerphobic. Mm. Um, and I went for that one, because I thought that'd be fun. <laughs> um, but I really enjoyed doing that because I got to play with my own personal rage um, and put that on the page and put a love story in there as well and create more than one woman, but let's say two women um, for, for context, um, who are not always good people, are often trying to do the right thing, but not necessarily in great ways, um, who mess things up and aren't very good to each other. And that's the kind of romance I wanted to read. So lots of knives to the throat. It's, that kind of vibe. It was, it was fun. Well, as Toni Morrison said, if there's a novel that you want to read and it doesn't exist, write it yourself. Yeah. So there you go. Thank you. Um, TJ, I want to um, uh, ask you about, um, there's a quote that I read from you. I'm scared to sort of you know, talk about quotes I've read now because I've got yours so wrong. But, um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> it's okay. No, no, I, I'm sorry. Um, but TJ, you've talked uh, before about queerness not being a plot point in your novels. Um, how do you go about writing queer characters, ensuring the sorry, and ensuring that the representation uh, you're going for uh, comes without drawing undue attention to their identities, uh, but also without ignoring their identities? If that makes sense. No, it does. And, and, and look, a queer queerness is. A major part of my life. It always has been since I was, I realized I was queer when I was nine, 10 years old, when 
Indiana Jones in the Temple of Doom made me think things that I should not have. <laughs> but um, I, yeah, I, yeah. Um, born in may 1982 um yeah, yeah i was like so, four when i first saw flash gordon but yes carry on. yeah but i mean th let's be honest the scene of indiana jones standing with us on the drawbridge like with the sword above his head and he's like pretty much shirtless i was like oh so that's what it means to like boys <laughs> 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 but look my queerness does not define me it is part of me it is a large part of me but it is a, it is a part of me and we are so much more than just what people think we are you know i am i defined by my queerness yeah probably to a lot of people who don't know me but that's what that's what i want to show with the types of books that i'm writing that that we don't need to focus on the coming out process all the time because if you think about it you know god love them there are so many great authors who who are far better writers than i that have written amazing coming out stories but the one thing i think that we lose focus on is that's not the end that is just the beginning because potentially anybody you meet for the rest of your life is someone that you have to come out to. It's not like when you come out, all of a sudden, everybody in the world knows that you're queer. That's not how it works. It's a process. It's a lifelong process. And there's something something that, that was mentioned a little bit earlier about you know the types of queer fiction and the types of uh, the plots that we go with. To me, and this is just my own personal taste and opinion, homophobia is fucking boring it is the most boring ridiculous thing in the world and the fact that we are still having to deal with it and transphobia in the year 2024 is the most mind-boggling thing to me i just don't understand how we can decide to hate others simply because of who they are i've never understood that so when i'm writing my books with the queer people in them i try to stay away from homophobia because I know what that feels like. I've been a victim of it many, many, many times myself. I mean, hell, there's times even the last few years, I have a rainbow sticker on my car. I'd gotten out at the grocery store, a random person called me a slur just because I had a rainbow sticker on my car just for existing. So when I try to write the characters that I write and when I'm telling the stories that I'm telling, I'm telling their stories of their queerness in relation to everything else that's going on in their world because again, it's not their whole, it's not their defining feature, it is part of them. And I wanna show that queer people, regardless of where they come from, regardless of their lot in life, get to have the same adventures, happiness, villainy, whatever it takes, because we deserve to be in these stories, we deserve to have our stories told. And for the people who want us to stop telling our stories, well, you, you're running out of luck, man, because we're gonna keep on going for as long as we're able. Thank you. And you also, I just want to ask you very quickly as well, just uh, as an addendum to that. Um, there's very much a yes and kind of um, aspect to, to, to the writing of the characters I feel in your books. Mm -hmm. um, because not only are they sort of representing uh, a corner of uh, our rainbow world, um, you write also a lot about, you know, neurodivergent characters, for example, you know, characters who are just very ordinary, sort of average Joes, Joes and Junos, if you like, um, you know, people who um, are learning and just are very ordinary. Um, so what is your process in terms of, because you have a lot of, you know, dialogue discussions in your, in your work where people are teaching each other things, teaching each other how to love effectively. It, it, so the, the worst thing that I think that we can do as a species is kind of cut ourselves off from each other is when we is when we get insular it's when we start making these little groups these little clicks because that is going to be cutting you off from 99.9% .9 of the world and all of the things that you can learn from the world we should not be focused just on our own lives our own culture there is so much out there in the world to look at to understand to listen about to learn about to to help to spread the message the word about you know it's we we th we think about the queerness and the queer books that we write and how important that they are and i for some for people listening for young people listening or watching this is very recent history this is history that is still hot to the touch when we talk about things like police raids in queer bars or we talk about 
the homosexuality being listed as a psychiatric disorder. This isn't something that happened hundreds and hundreds of years ago. This is within lifetimes of people who are probably watching this, that we see these things. So when I'm writing about the normal everyday people, it's because normal everyday people exist. Normal everyday people are queer. Normal everyday people have ADHD or have are, are people with autism. I have ADHD. And the one thing that I've learned the most over my life about having ADHD with people who don't understand it is they think I'm broken. They think I need to be fixed, that there's something wrong with me. There is nothing wrong with who I am as far as my, my neurodiversity goes. There's some other stuff. Yeah, probably there's a bunch of stuff wrong with me. But it's the idea that we that we need to be fixed, that we are broken, that we need to be cured is something that has been around, especially with queerness, for a very long time. It's, I mean, how many times have we heard the stories of the gay gene and what that means and and how, if if possible, if we can isolate that, maybe we can get rid of homosexuality as in total. No, man, that's not how it works. You're, queer people are always going to exist. We've always been here and we will always be here. Amen. Yeah. So from chosen family to lesbian necromancy. <laughs> It's a natural trick. <laughs> yeah, it is. Um, so first of all, what turned you on to lesbian necromancy? It's the crux <laughs> of a novel. <laughs> You know what? what Everybody's like, oh man, you must have been interested in lesbian necromancy from like day one. It's a very <laughs> recent development. <laughs> you know, I don't really know how that one got in there, to be honest, because, you know, I gotta admit, I'd never actually been that interested in necromancy before. Um, you know, so then I came out. Um, <laughs> and, you know, I think it was a case where I love writing body horror. Hmm. And I. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You do. <laughs> Thank you. Um, <laughs> And, I mean, maybe this is extremely self-revealing, but writing my first lesbian book, you know, ended up being very physical, very messy, very weird and destructive. And, you know, looking back, it's like, oh, I'm working through some issues. <laughs> uh, but it's a case where I think, you know, necromancy has been the means to the end, you know, the very sort of, like, splattery, wet means to the end. Um, I was not previously that into necromancers, you know. It wasn't a thing that I was, like, keeping under the bed. Um, I've just been using it, you know, as a tool. She's protesting too much, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> you stay over there. Um, yeah, I, um, I read, uh, again, I read an interview. Um, uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but, um, no, I'm not going to ask the question. Because I, oh, no, I can't no. find it, that's why. Oh. Um, so, uh, let's talk about the language that you use, okay. Um, which is, uh, it's incredible. Um, so, so you're reading this body horror and, you know, okay, I used to work at a restaurant called St. John. I don't know if anyone knows St. John's, just um, up the road. Um, and on my first day, so St. John, right, they serve suckling, like whole roast suckling pigs. Wow. wow to tables of 10 people. And on my first day, I had to um, serve a suckling pig and actually cut it and open it up. So you take the head off and you present it on a plate and you give it to the person whose party it is. <laughs> Happy <fast> birthday! <laughs> <laughs> and then you open up the spine, you open it, you take out the bones and everything, you sort of mush it up. Oh my and God. Sort of... <laughs> Who is doing this for their birthday? <laughs> Do you put a candle on the head? <laughs> or like a little apple in the mouth? Not even an apple <laughs> in the mouth. Like, it's crazy. Um, cool. But, yeah, then you sort of create these sort of platters of, um, of pulled pork, effectively, with, you know, crispy skin or whatever, um, full of stuffing and onions. And I was reminded of that when I was reading. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's the biggest compliment anybody's ever paid <laughs> Um, but, you know, your writing itself, like, it's really um, incredible because it sort of combines this, like, high gothic sort of biblical, allegorical stuff with, like, more colloquial stuff, um, memes, etc. Where does that all come from? Oh, you know, it's my chocolate and peanut butter. I do genuinely believe that both things make the other thing <laughs> pop. I'm sorry, so, like, that came out, like, pop language. Um, I think it is genuinely a case where part of it is being a Kiwi. So, okay, you know, um, 
when you are a New Zealander, you can't take yourself seriously for that long. You've got a little timer going off. I think it's one thing about our national character that is a strength. It also absolutely is a weakness. But, you know, when you are writing high gothic kind of Mervyn Peak, Sal Gorman Gastian stuff, you have about 60 seconds before you want to, like, slip in a fart noise. <laughs> <laughs> and, okay. Uh, you know, it works for me because, you know, I'm, I'm the type of person who's like, ha-ha, there was a fart noise. Um, <laughs> and, you know, it doesn't work for everybody. But for me, I just love that sensation of, like, the high crashing chord, the melodrama is like, you know? It's kind of a churn of registers that I think yeah, I love the that. eviscerations Fun. and mutilations being described. Mm. Um, I don't know why you keep laughing at things that I'm saying that are quite profound. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but thank you. So what I was going to ask um, was, so I did read somewhere uh, that Gideon, the first novel in the Locked Tomb series, came about in the first instance from a one-pager that you wrote shortly before commencement, like a week before or yep. something like that? Yep. Um, does that mean that you flew by the seat of your pants, or was there more sort of planning and world building that went on as, as you wrote? Oh, I found that page the other day, just like the back of a really random notebook. Um, and, you know, this may say something, it was the notebook I was trying to teach myself Latin in. Um, <laughs> okay. And it's about a page and a half. Okay. And it's the entire plot of what was meant to be three novels. Wow. And, uh, you know, I wrote it when I was trapped on a plane because the plane flight that you take from New Zealand to London Heathrow is very long and you're trapped in a coffin flying through the air, mm -hmm. um, which may have led to some stuff in the series. <laughs> and, you know, I just wrote it all down. Mm -hmm. um, and from there, the genesis of almost the entire, you know, trilogy, quadrilogy came. Mm. And the thing is that, like, it's actually mapped out. I have not deviated from that plan. Everything that was there is there, except for one thing. In the original, my main character was meant to be some kind of cool fireman. Mm. That <laughs> would have been quite a different vibe. Um, it would have been a different vibe. It would have been an absolutely different vibe. I don't know how I would have like gotten that in there. <laughs> I was going to say the opposite. I feel like like if you'd made Gideon a fireman, nothing would have changed. No, no, like, no. yeah. <laughs> we have two very different opinions. <laughs> I don't know which one I subscribe to quite. But, yeah, I mean, I am really grateful because, you know, that single page and a half has kept me, you know, on the straight and narrow because I'm not somebody who flies by the seat of their pants. You know, I, I can't. I need a plot to go on um, because, to me, when I'm writing, I don't know about you guys, if I'm just noodling around, I'm like, oh, I don't know where I'm writing to. I need a point Z always. Um, otherwise, I just don't know where I'm going. So thank you, that one page and a half. Um, sorry the fireman thing didn't get in there, but, you know, <laughs> you win some, you lose some. Samantha, are you a planner, 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 or do you uh, deviate at all? No, I have to be a planner pretty much because I came up with the idea for The Bone Season, which is my debut series, and it's a seven-book series. And for <laughs> me, I just don't think I could have been flying by the seat of my pants. Having said that, um, I'm currently working on the fifth book in the series, and that was very different in my original plan, which I found the other day. There was a whole pregnancy plot line that was very, very... <laughs> <laughs> it was very Renesmee. <laughs> And then I realised, and then I realised that somebody else had already done that <laughs> with Renesme. <laughs> so that was going to be pregnant. Yeah, wild, right? Like Paige is not a, a character who just strikes me as someone who would be pregnant. So it's just, it, it was just. Look, I was really into Twilight. Okay. <laughs> so. That was the only bit that really majorly changed. But I agree with you, Tamsin, because um, I think that if you are just kind of wondering, it's like if you have a map, but you don't have a destination. Mm. You can still wander and reach a destination. But for me, I need to know the destination so that I can choose a route to get there. Like, mm. it's like you can take different routes to get to the same place, right? But, yeah, I need to know the destination. Otherwise, I am just kind of wandering around. Um, it's a little bit different with Priory and A Day of Fallen Night because they're both standalones. So mm. they work together, but they are separate from one another. So they still require like quite intense plotting, but it's not quite the same as it is with the Bone Season series where I have to plant seeds in the first book that are mm. going to blossom in the seventh book, for example. So yeah, mostly a pl plotter other than the, um, the pregnancy bit. <laughs> so but you're, you've got two series on the go. Yes. So um, the Bone Season and the Roots of Chaos. Yes. 
Um, and you like to immerse yourself in one book at a time rather than sort of spin plates. Yeah, I do. I'm much more of an immersive person, yeah. But is there ever a time where you kind of think, oh, no, that's an idea for this book, and then you sort of shift over a little bit? or? Um, not really. I find that I do keep them pretty separate, um, just because I... I mean, people sometimes say, "Are you? Go would you ever get them confused? And I'm like, no. <laughs> you know, one of them is set in the future, and it's about clairvoyance and hot giants, and then the other one <laughs> is about dragons and lesbians. So they're, they're <laughs> it's quite different vibes. Um, but yeah, no, I find I just need to really stick in one world at a time. I'm just someone who needs to really sink into something. Like, I just don't think... I, I wouldn't be able to flip between them very easily. And also just scheduling means that I end up working on one rather than the other, usually. What was it like signing... I mean, so the Bones season is seven books. It is. But you signed uh, a book deal for three books originally with, with Bloomsbury. Yes. I would panic. I don't know. Um... Right, TJ, because like, you're just like, <laughs> okay, well, I've written the first book. Now I'm signing this, like, book deal. Uh, that means I've got to write two more. Yeah. And I've actually told them the seven. Six, six more, yeah. So <laughs> is, that, is that pressure or, like, I mean, how do you deal with that? I mean, it was self-inflicted pressure. <laughs> no, I, I, was, I was the one, and I was very, very young when I got my book deal. I was only 20. I wrote right. The Bone Season when I was 19. Mm. Um, and I went to Bloomsbury with all the confidence in the world and was like, I want to write seven books. Mm. They were like, sure. <laughs> like, mm. Yeah. Yeah. So actually, I still feel fine about it. Honestly, I honestly think that I would prefer it to be like nine books, but now mm. I'm in a situation where seven is just really symbolic in the series, so we're mm. sticking with seven, but the last two books are probably going to be massive. Um, <laughs> but no, I kind of thrive off that to the point where my agent was actually very suspicious when I came to him with the, the idea for the Priory of the Orange Tree, because I said very earnestly, this is going to be a standalone. <laughs> and my agent was like, is it, though? <laughs> and I was like, yeah, why would you think otherwise, David? And he was like, well, you came to me when you were a teenager and said that you wanted to write a seven-book series, and now you're expecting me to believe that you can create this whole world and just purely just stick with that. Mm. You're going with that, are you? And I was like, yes, David, yes. Mm. And I went away, and then several months later, I was, like, into the Priory of the Orange Tree. I was like, oh, wouldn't it be interesting if I did a prequel? Mm. <laughs> I went back, and I said, right, David, I'm not saying you were right. <laughs> but what if I pitched a prequel? <laughs> and he was like, okay. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I, I am someone who thrives on long series, and now the Priory of the Orange Tree is probably going to be like a series of standalones. But I still maintain that they are standalones, and mm -hmm. therefore my agent was wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, backstage, we were talking a little bit about uh, some more sort of political things. Um, TJ, I, felt, I feel like you led that part of the conversation. There, there was something kind of, um, I don't know, there was a kind of anger maybe that sort mm -hmm. of came out um, because being in the States, um, you're experiencing and witnessing book bannings um, a lot of the time uh, when it comes to, to queer fiction of all age groups, of all levels, of all genres. Um, can we maybe have a conversation between us about, like, I guess, the sort of transatlantic um, nature of us as politicized writers. Yeah, absolutely. So I don't know if y'all know this, but the United States is a fucking mess, y'all. <laughs> we are, we are um, in the middle of a culture war that we are having librarians now need to be on the front lines of. You have... You have these right-wing fundamentalist religious organizations coming into towns and communities and basically attacking libraries, saying, you have queer books in your library, ergo, you are a groomer and enabling such things as pedophilia. This is the language that is being used against queer authors, queer writers, against queer librarians, against teachers against, you know, teachers and librarians are not paid enough to deal with this crap. They are not paid enough for the job that they do. But to add this on top of it, to add this on whether you don't know if what you're saying or what you're teaching or if what you believe for the children you're trying to educate is going to suddenly be flipped and reversed on you by some random person who comes in from the community and saying, you know what? I don't like the fact that you taught this. I don't like the fact that you let kids read these books. I don't like the fact that there's kids have access to this kinds of stuff because you, again, 
you're a, a, a groomer, you are indoctrinating children. What I find so ridiculous about this is how how we seem to be circling back to this same exact thing that we did before. For those that don't know, in the 1970s in the United States, there was a woman named Anita Bryant. Anita Bryant, in the 50s, she was a, a serviceable singer. Then she decided to become a beauty queen. And then in the 70s, she decided that she wanted to help the world eradicate the menace that was homosexuality. So what did she do? She went to the state of Florida and said, we're going to start finding, we're going to start this organization called Save Our Children. And what she said was basically that teachers, librarians, books in schools are indoctrinating children into homosexuality. This was in the 70s. This is the exact same conversations that are happening right now in 2024 in the United States. I am one of the lucky ones because I am what is probably considered a safe gay. I am a white dude, a cis white dude. I write about queer people, but I am not a queer person of color. I am not a trans person. Those are the authors that are more under attack than any other group in the United States at this moment in time. Let me put it this way. If you guys know who Chuck Tingle is, Chuck Tingle is a very well-known erotica author. And he recently uh, was traditionally published with Tor Nightfire for his books, Camp Damascus and his new book, Bury Your Gaze. I adore that man. I think he is a remarkable, wonderful person. We were supposed to go together to the Texas Library Association Conference next month, or in April, excuse me. And the he Chuck Tingle was going to be the key, one of the keynote speakers, and I was going to be on a panel with him. The only reason I said yes to go to Texas was because Chuck Tingle was going to be there. A couple of weeks ago, knowing full well who Chuck Tingle was and how he presents himself, he is neurodiverse. He wears a mask to help prevent uh, to help keep his anonymity, but it also helps him with his, some neurodiverse issues that he has. They told Chuck Tingle, the Texas Library Association. Some of our librarians might get uncomfortable with how you present yourself. So we're going to need you to remove your mask if you plan on coming here. Once I heard about that, because we had to, you know, how these things work behind the scenes is they told Chuck and his team. And then my team told me after Chuck was already informed and, and whatnot. But the thing that really, really sucked about this is that they know who Chuck Tingle is. They know what he looks like, how he presents himself. And the fact that someone might be uncomfortable with someone wearing a mask is if we didn't just go through four years of a pandemic with everybody having to wear a mask, it blew my mind. And then once they were called out for it, the Texas Library Association issued a quote unquote apology that basically said, oh, we didn't know what we were doing. And so we hope Chuck comes back. Bye. And that was it. That is what queer people and queer authors are dealing with, especially queer authors of color and trans authors are dealing with in the United States right this very second, because people have the right to go in from off the streets and say, I don't want you to have this book here in certain, certain states in our country, in my country, you are allowed to call the police on librarians. You are allowed to call the police on teachers. If you think something you don't like, such as a book being in classroom, is in a classroom. And people have been charged for this. There was a man, a former Republican senator, who filed a lawsuit against Barnes and Nobles for carrying uh, 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 the book, what a, a book about trans issues. He sued the book. And they sued Barnes and Noble for that. And when Barnes and Noble said, we're going to keep stocking the book, he turned around and sued the publisher and the author herself. The lawsuit went nowhere, but that is the very real thing that we're dealing with in the United States. What happens if a case like that gets in front of the one judge who thinks, you know what, there's merit to this. What is that going to lead to? The idea of book banning is a slippery slope that will only end in disaster for everybody. Do we not know, learn from the history of the world? Do we not see what people have done in the past and how history regards those people? What are we gonna think about the people in 20 to 30 years from now 
who are trying to ban books. I already know what I think about them. <laughs> they suck ass. But we need to make sure that people like that do not get to win, that they do not get to, to take books from the people who need them most. You don't know if there is a queer kid in some rural area who doesn't have access to the things that maybe urban kids get to have, people who live in big cities. There may be kids out there who don't get that kind of access, and the only way they can find themselves in media is in books. And that is something that we're trying to take away from them. Why would you do that? Why do you hate children so much that you're trying to take away things from them that will make them happy? And the last thing I'll say on this, you have so many adults talking about what is best for children. Why the hell is nobody asking what the children think? Because the children one day, five years, 10 years from now, they're gonna be the ones voting and they're gonna, they are, they know what's going on. They are pissed off and they are gonna change the world for the better. And we should be ashamed for letting it get this far. Mm. It really sort of um, connects to what you were saying earlier when you brought up Section 28 mm -hmm. um, and the sort of um, the anger that that generation kind of felt after it was repealed, maybe when... I don't know if they felt... I don't know. Well, did I feel anger? Did you feel anger? I don't know. Um, mm, I'm not really... I don't really remember. I do. So, <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think a lot of people didn't know it was happening. Yeah. Let's put it that way. Yeah, that when, it wasn't... So I can't remember the exact dates, but it was pretty much the entire time I was in secondary school, so probably crossed over with yours somewhat. Mm. It was um, 1988 that it was brought in. Thank you. And it so was repealed in 2000. I wasn't in secondary oh. school in 1988, just to be clear. But, um, <laughs> it, but it, it was essentially a law that meant that teachers could not promote homosexuality. And in practice, this often meant that if children were bullied for being gay which a lot of kids were, whether they were gay or not, because that's what school was like. You know, it was like, you're gay. Um, you, you wouldn't be defended, because they, a lot of teachers took this as a sign that they couldn't defend homosexuality in any way, shape, or form, which meant not doing anything when there was homophobia, essentially. But is this, is this what we're trying to fight against now in terms of, um, you know, well, against TERFs, essentially. Yeah. I, I think what's interesting to me, talking like when, when TJ was talking about history, is I, I do think lessons have been learned from history, but probably the wrong lessons. Yeah. Because if, if you look at colonization, you look at empire, you look at pretty much any pogrom against any minority group, there's, there's, a, there's a, a language that is used that dehumanizes people, right? This is um, pedophilia. This is monstrous. This is inhuman right it becomes there are words and language that we've all heard that make certain groups feel less human or seem less human and if you do it long enough normal people start to believe it on some level they go well you know i didn't think they were that bad but if, if everyone's saying that they're that bad they must be this they must mm. be this mm. and that's an old playbook that's been used against so many different groups throughout history we've seen it over and over again we go oh god that was terrible we should never do that again it happens again mm. because it's a very useful methodology for people who have a lot of power to redirect anger and hate mm. you know like oh you know yes you can't buy a house but Look at that trans woman. Mm. <laughs> that, you know, and it sounds mm. ridiculous, right? But that's essentially how it works. Mm. Um, I don't know where I was going with this, but I will say <laughs> that um, you know, I think part of what's important about engaging with um, the you know the larger queer struggle or engaging with any struggle for rights is a recognition that we are as bad as everyone who came before us, right? And that as much as I want to believe in a better world, these systems of oppression are very effective. And to overcome them is hard work. And it means recognizing that we're all capable of being the worst people mm. who would do to us exactly what we've been talking about. We are capable of doing the same thing. And so we have to be vigilant and we have to be better. And part of being better is actually genuinely embracing the, the whole range of queerness, which includes the stuff that isn't pure, right? Mm. It's like we should have stories that are filthy and awful because actually there should be room for that in our mm. understanding of queer identity. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's the end of my rant. I really don't know where I began with this, but I'll just it let it end. Gave. I loved it. <laughs> um, so we're going to open up to questions from the audience and to uh, questions coming from uh, our online audience as well. Um, so um, formulate your question. Let's make it nice and succinct and direct it to all of us or to um, individuals on the panel. And John has um, questions from online. There are a couple of mics around as well. So who'd like to go first? 
Ooh, okay. Um, oh, okay, yeah, <laughs> sorry. Hi, I have a question for Tamsin. I hope you can settle the debate. Um, <laughs> Shh, it's fine. I won't. Um, the chussy, you describe it as having teeth. <laughs> Does it have teeth or are they ribs? I missed that. Sorry. <laughs> oh, don't, don't. Oh, don't make me repeat it. Um, no, you know what? Let me explain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go ahead, Tossie. Go ahead. So it was a perfectly normal thing I did. <laughs> One of my characters in my latest book uh, ends up having a slit in their chest. I told you, suckling pig. Yeah. <laughs> And, you know, I don't call it anything. It's just a normal slit, possibly almond-shaped, who knows, um, in the chest. And, you know, I find out that some of my beautiful, delightful readers have given this um, particular wound a name. <laughs> and, you know, we talk about how we love the... Oh, did you say chussy? Yeah. No, 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 no. <laughs> no. I, I said chussy. It, it's also known as a chunt, just yeah. in case. <laughs> Better. You know, it's not the tongue. Yeah. We, don't, we don't mishear. Okay. Like, we can mishear chussy. We don't mishear chunt. No. <laughs> yeah, anyway, what was the question? Oh, what's the rest of the question? Oh, shit. Um, <laughs> oh, teeth or ribs. Teeth or ribs. Yeah, you described them, uh, the chussy as having uh, teeth. Yep. Um, but we're kind of wondering, are they actually teeth or are they ribs? Uh, you're going to find out in the last book. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> I mean, thank you, but thank also... You. <laughs> Thank you for nothing, but <laughs> shan't. I'm sorry, that's the best question I've ever heard at an event. I mean, nothing's ever going to top that. Having that one come out first out the gate. <laughs> best answer as yeah. well. Yeah. Hi, a uh, question for Tamsin. So... <laughs> okay, this is the last no. question for Tamsin. Yeah. yeah. Yep, yep. Okay, Two so and I'm, I'm out. Okay. So part of what I think is really fantastic about your writing is that you blend this really queer lens with this sort of high Catholic, quite traditional view of power, of masculinity. How do you kind of navigate that relationship of taking on the aesthetic, but at the same time not sort of endorsing it, right? The critique is there, but how do you kind of walk that line in what you're writing? Oh man, I'd love to know if I walk that line because it's a case of I'm still navigating. I think that I'm gonna have to see for myself by the end of the book, did I navigate it? because there are things I am obviously trying to say, but, you know, I am saying them, you know, I'm not making up as I go along, but I am kind of reflecting as I do it, like, oh, shit, am I doing it right? And as, you know, it's an ongoing process. I can't say what trick I use, because I don't know if I did it yet. Um, I am doing it as I speak, you know, I'm, I'm still writing the last book, and it's a case where I really hope that by the end I navigate it to say what I want to say rather than it being like, oh, this is a how-to manual on how to do a fascist necromantic empire. Um, <laughs> which would probably get me some money, but, you know, it's not quite what I want to be doing. But, yeah, we'll see by the end of the book. I hope I at least do something. Okay, can we have um, the, pers the person on the third row, second in? And then, John, do you have a question? So just, uh, just hold on for the mic so everyone can hear you. Thank you. Oddly enough, it's a question for Tamsin. Ah. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll be quick. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so for me, reading the to him was quite a revelationary experience, seeing a queer normative story built around this kind of scaffolding of biblical imagery, Catholic imagery, religious allusions, and all these quotes. These things come from a group of people who historically have not been the most welcoming to the queer community. Using that kind of framework for writing the lot to him, how did you approach including these different aspects of religion and your kind of reinterpretation and recontextualization of them within the lot to him? How did that affect your world building of it? I mean, I'm just building it because, you know, lesbian Catholic. It's, it's kind of out there on the page. I mean, I know that sounds like a massive cheat, you know, like, oh, well, you know, you're just reflecting yourself. We talk about the fact that we reflect ourselves on the page. And I really liked what TJ said, um, you know, especially about queer norm, about which stories we want to tell and about which stories we absolutely don't want to tell. And to me, it has been super empowering using this very Catholic framework to tell, you know, for me, the gayest story I've ever told. 
And, you know, it's scary, especially writing the last book because, oh, that's gotten so on the page. Oh, man, it's gotten everywhere. It's like spilling gravy. Um, I don't know why I'm using all these food metaphors tonight. After you, like, talked about the suckling pig, I just... Food. Um, Are you hungry? Yeah, I am hungry. <laughs> I, I had, like, a prep sandwich a couple hours ago, but, like... It's not going to fill you up. No, it's not. <laughs> I'll stop with the food metaphors. Again, it's a case where it is reflecting me. It's messy. I don't think I always do it right. Again, I'm navigating as I go. Um, it's been meaningful for me, so just hearing that it has been meaningful for anyone else um, makes it worth it. But I really just hope that by the end of the last book, again, it has got... I'm kind of worried about being excommunicated. <laughs> <laughs> For one scene in particular. But, um, That's the power they have over you, the church. Yeah. Oh, but nobody gets excommunicated anymore, not with our Pope. Um, so, you know, just fingers crossed that I'm not... Well, you have God as a character in your, in your books. Yeah, he sucks. You've got the insight, right? <laughs> so, yeah, thank you for seeing that, appreciating it. John? Uh, yeah, hi. Um, this, uh, there's quite a lot of qu great questions coming in from the online audience, so thanks to all of those. This question technically is from um, Jess in Australia, who got up at 6am, and she leads uh, a TLT fan server called Known as Birthday Party, which is obviously a Discord uh, for Tamsin's series. But the question is for everybody, and it's what, what advice would you give to someone who's seeking writing motivation? Tell us oh. what do you think? Why, why do I have to answer this one first? <laughs> Times in needs a sip of water. Yeah, exactly. While, while everyone else speaks. <laughs> Sorry, I'm not, is that censorship? <laughs> You're assuming that any of us have writing motivation. <laughs> no, I mean, come on, you publish like a 500 page novel once every two years. I mean, I wish I had that level of pro productivity. No, this is true. I often get asked, and like, motivation. how I get through the process of writing a 900 page novel. Yeah. Mm. Um, I just really want to just tell that gay enemies to lovers pretty much that drives me through it I'm, I'm not really sure how I do it I just kind of do it like I'm, I'm really bad at giving writing advice actually because I realize that it's so difficult to give writing advice because it's this idea I feel like it's never one size fits all is the problem and something that works for me is not going to necessarily work for other people so weirdly the advice I normally give is don't take too much advice <laughs> um and yeah that's that's pretty much it right are you, are you uh, a sort of eight hours a day sort of treat it like a a nine-to-five. Yeah, I mean, I think that, that does help with the motivation, like, I try to set myself. I mean, I'm not very good at setting myself a specific time period. Like, I'm normally working, like, deep into the night when I shouldn't be. But, yeah, I've always, I've always found it really tricky to, to say, like, how to keep motivated and stuff, because it's so, it's so difficult to know, like, a writer's exact circumstances, for example. Yeah, it's just, it's, I've, always, I've just always found that very difficult. I will say that, like, if you see a piece of writing advice, like, I always remember there was a very famous writer who shall remain unnamed who said something like, you know, you have to write a thousand words a day to be a writer. And for me, that's just, yeah, thank you, TJ. <laughs> <laughs> Same reaction. And it's just, it's very, it's very frustrating because there's so many reasons that you might not be able to write a thousand words a day. I don't write a thousand words a day a lot of the time. So it's, it's frustrating when you see that kind of very prescriptive writing advice. Um, I mean, I have migraines and I went through a period of being in, like, constant chronic pain a couple of years ago so mm. it just would have been impossible for me to write a thousand words a day so yeah that wasn't very helpful <laughs> I'll let what? someone else go on. just want to interject there to one brilliant quote that I read from you in an interview um, you don't run a marathon to train for a marathon I think I ripped that off so it was really good mm. it's, so, <laughs> it's so true I'm, like, gonna, I'm gonna rip that off you yeah, yeah. <laughs> we ripped it off yeah I mean, just quote. sort of coming up with this kind of um, arbitrary word count in order to sort of say that you've, you know, done your job for the day. Yeah, it's frustrating. Doesn't always make sense. Yeah, and also a lot of stuff that you're doing that isn't writing is still you planning, is still you absorbing. You know, you are actually planning for your story if you are watching, reading, you know, absorbing media is part of the job. Yeah. Um, you know, you've got to get your inspiration from somewhere. You can't just turn it on like a tap. So a lot of the stuff that doesn't look like the sitting down, writing a thousand words is still writing. The thinking, mm. yeah. Oh, yeah. thinking so much a part of it. Yeah. It's so exhausting. It's so exhausting. I think all the time. <laughs> Actually, I will say with motivation, a trick I do use is that I'm not the kind of writer who skips ahead, so I have to write chronologically, mm. which means that having the scenes I really want to write ahead of me, like, that's the way I fuel myself yeah. through. Like, for example, in my latest 900-page tome, <laughs> uh, the lesbians don't kiss until about page 780. <laughs> oh, I just, the edging. I really, I, People say I'm bad. <laughs> 
I love a slow burn, but literally it drove me through the whole book was getting to that kiss. <laughs> and then after that, they don't kiss again for like another 100 pages. So it's pretty much, yeah, just have to have the lesbian kiss right at the end. And, yeah, Icon. Motivates you. <laughs> Do you have the sex scene like really early in the book? No, that's two, that's two for that's an different. Well. I'm talking about the other lesbian couple. Oh, sorry, this book has sorry. two because yeah. they let me get away with the Priory of the Orange Tree. <laughs> and then I came back with like, why not two lesbian couples? <laughs> Have you ever seen a Celebrity Bake Off where James Acaster? <laughs> I love you so much. <laughs> but you also know this is true. Um, you know, he's like, started making it, had a breakdown, bon appetit. <laughs> Literally my process. That's beginning to end. Quote of the day. <laughs> uh, TJ, do you want to add anything? No, I, I just... The, the phrase lesbian edging is stuck in my head now, so I have to let that go. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, at the back, sort of three rows in. Uh, this question is for everyone, but Tamsin knows why I'm asking and might remember me. How have we gotten this far into this panel without talking about Homestuck? <laughs> Yeah, because I mean, we talked a bit about fan fiction. Because we don't know what Homestuck okay, is. Okay, roast me for yeah. my questions then. <laughs> no, I watched. I you said it was for everyone. Yeah. I'm going to answer it. I watched, a, I watched a whole YouTube video on what Homestuck is, and I finished that video. It was like two hours long. Yeah. I still don't know what Homestuck <laughs> is. No, I have Nobody no idea. Does. I don't either. <laughs> I don't think anybody in this room knows what Homestuck was. My mistake. <laughs> okay, I... back row. <laughs> I have a question for everybody. Um, of the characters that you've created within your books, which is your favourite and like, what are the tips that you had for characterising them? Hmm. Lovely question. Yeah, it is lovely. Everyone, everyone's questions are lovely. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I haven't understood like 50% of them. But <laughs> <laughs> like home What, the questions chassis? or your characters? <laughs> <laughs> the questions. <laughs> no, I think explaining quietly, trying to explain Chessie was uh, the highlight of the <laughs> And I like Tasha was like, do you know what that means? <laughs> <laughs> TJ, do you want to go first? Because I feel like we've been talking over you a little bit on this one. Um, you know, I'm still stuck on lesbian edging and chunt and Chessie. Those are things that... I did not know I would learn today, and I wish I didn't. <laughs> so, so um, okay, I, I've made no secret. My, my favorite character I've ever written and, and probably will continue to think is my favorite character ever is Chauncey from The House in the Cerulean Sea. I adore the little boy blob who wants to be a bellhop because he, he makes me happy. He was always going to be that type of character and and going in and writing what I was writing about in the house in this really and see and, and this idea of institutionalized bigotry and how the government fails us time and time again. Um, I wanted to have a basically a life draft. I, I wanted to have a kid in this book who no matter what he went through, no matter what happened, he was he was this beacon of sunshine. It doesn't mean he couldn't feel sad or upset or angry or furious, but he would also be you know, the best of us. He would he would see the upside in people. People, humanity disappoints me on a on a regular basis. It, it, every day, all day, all I have to do is turn on the news and I'll see more and more evidence of of why we haven't really proven ourselves as having the right to exist. But here's what I think: when we when we look at 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 the people who are the ones who are helping, the ones who are positive, the ones who are trying to make a difference. Those are the people that I, I wish we could all talk about more, the people that I wish that we could we could celebrate more. And, and Chauncey is that character for me. He is that kid who, who wants to be something so badly and knowing full well that there might be people who dislike him or even hate him because of how he looks. He's still going to do that. Do you remember being a kid and finding something that you'd never heard of before or, or learn more about. And suddenly that became your sole focus for however long. For me, it was ironically, again, because of Dr. Indiana Jones, but I wanted to be an archaeologist. I wanted to be an archaeologist so bad that I could taste it. Everything about my life became about archaeology for months and months and months. 
And that's how it is for Chauncey. He read about wanting to be a bellhop. He learned about wanting to be a bellhop. He was taught about what a bellhop does. And of course, that's what he's going to want to be. And I, the fact that he was able to do that, to fulfill his dream, is for every kid who got told no, who got told you're not good enough, who got told you don't look right enough or you're not straight enough. We, I just love the fact that Chauncey is able to realize his dream and have that kind of hope in a world where hope can sometimes be at short supply. Thank you. Do you have any uh, favorite characters in your work, Stasha? Uh, um, maybe Boomika in the Jasmine Throne. She's a uh, so she. The, there are three main women in the Jasmine Throne, and uh, she's the one that's straight um, for her sins. Uh, <laughs> but she is the. She starts the novel as. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> She's the very much, she's the younger, pretty, very quiet wife of the governor of this colonized district of um, Parajadeva, which is the, um, the place that this is based in. And she doesn't, and she's pregnant, so she's doing what she's expected to do. She's being pretty and pregnant. Um, but she is actually, um, I mean, I don't think this is ruining it for anybody. She actually has um, humongous connections to rebellion in the, that nation. Her particular approach to it is very different from the straightforward rebels, whose right is up to you, not to me. Um, and she spends the entire book basically conniving and plotting in the background around her husband um, in order to try and move towards gaining more independence for her colonized nation. So she's good fun. Um, she, you know, she, she's just like very pregnant and very fed up for the whole book, which I think is quite fun. Um, hormonal. <laughs> huh? Hormonal. I mean, I don't know. She's not like, I, I don't know. Is she hormonal? I mean, she must be, but she's busy more than anything else. Um, That's so great. Yep. Yeah, and I, I, I think one of my favorite scenes I ever wrote was with her when, uh, I, I don't know, I just might say it, like when um, she finds out that her husband's still alive and she's like, damn, what am I going to do now? And it was just very, very fun to write her. Oh, I love her. Yeah. Um, should we have, do we have any more online? Oh, my goodness, hands. Um, if we don't, then we've got Go plenty the room, in the room. Yeah. So, um, glasses, green, cardigan. <laughs> We're just admiring your look anyway, so just keep serving. <laughs> Thank you. Also, this is blue. <laughs> like. <laughs> anyway. This uh, is blue. <laughs> anyway, I wanted to ask. Well, uh, as we're in the British Library, and I know some of your works um, focus on this subject a lot, I wanted to ask about the legacy of imperialism and how that's come up in your writing. I know. Obviously, Tamsin's book series focuses quite a lot on empire, um, but I'm sure it's come up uh, in plenty of your other works as well. So I'd like to ask your thoughts and opinions on that and how it's influenced your writing. Ah, oh, the big one in the room. <laughs> the big imperial elephant in the room. The big yes. Like, it's just yeah. a huge, ugly imperial elephant. Well, I mean, you can't write in English without engaging with imperialism, whether no, wittingly or unwittingly, right? Absolutely. Like, yeah. Correct. Yeah, encoded in the language. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, you know, I find it really interesting that, you know, obviously I am from a colonial country and I know that thoroughly influences my world building, my writing, who I'm writing about. You know, how is it to be in England writing English colonialism? Mm -hmm. Like, is it something you think about doing or does it just like permeate? I think, it, I think you can do both. Yeah. I think, yeah. Like, I, I do feel like if you go to the roots of what literature is in general but you look at fantasy literature colonialism and empire written into the way it works yeah. right we have kings we have princes often we have often we have some depiction of feudalism why has my voice got louder that's really... um and and you can't avoid that if you claim that you're writing work that is apolitical well congratulations you're just playing into the mainstream politics um so i think it's it's somewhat unavoidable yeah that's yeah yeah. Mm. Is there something about the fantasy genre that sort of lends itself intrinsically to sort of, you know, because you, you write about sort of ancient periods. Um, you've written in the burn season about like Irish heritage. And, yeah. and is there something about this genre that sort of really lends itself intrinsically to, to 
asking questions and filling in the gaps at times where there's less knowledge um, in terms of, yeah, imperialism, colonialism. I don't, I don't think that the fantasy genre is necessarily, and until recently perhaps, been trying to, oh no, that's a lie, it has often been trying mm. to inter interrogate imperialism. But what fantasy often does is it, it interrogates and explores fantastical versions of nation building. Right? So if you, that's exactly what Tolkien did, right? And, and you can, I think you actually know more about Tolkien for all that you have beef with him. But like, um, but essentially he was trying to create um, a British mythology, which is a very difficult thing to do for a variety of reasons, including colonialism. Um, and therefore he was trying to create a concept of nation building, of, of mythology, because you can't have a nation without its mythology. They, they go hand in hand. Yeah. It's like St. George and the Dragon, right? Yeah. And so I, I think that in fantasy, often what a lot of modern fantasists are doing is exploring nation building in a very like specific and focused way and saying, okay, so this is our fantasy of what it means to be a person with a past. Mm. What are we going to do with that? Mm. Especially because the cliche idea of fantasy for me has always been there's a castle, there's a dragon, there's probably a king. Mm. You know, that stuff is mythical, it is fable, it goes all the way back. Mm. But because I think especially we tended to reproduce that over the years unthinkingly, I think that we're now having a movement back against it, as you said, to kind of actually interrogate it rather than just have it sit there and like, that's fantasy, it's the castle, it's the king. It kind of looks like a, a very extruded product of a British medieval period that actually didn't exist. Mm -hmm. mm. Like, what if the king is an evil god? I mean, what if, oh. you know... Oh, man, you could write my books for me. <laughs> Dear God, no. <laughs> <laughs> I wish. Um, I mean, what if St George isn't the hero, right? Mm. These well, are the no, questions exactly. that we ask. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and I, yes, I do interrogate um, also English sort of colon colonisation of Ireland as well in the Bone Season series. I think that was almost more the dystopian angle of the series in a way um, because the bone season is both fantasy and dystopia and I really wanted to interrogate the idea of like England often being presented as this kind of heroic nation and I really wanted to take that back and to present England as the aggressor that it actually was historically mm. um, so that's how I engaged with it in the bone season series um, and then with the Priory the Orange Tree again it has kind of kings and queens and that kind of feudalism but I wanted to to, to kind of strip that down and say, like, basically look at hereditary monarchy and how horrendous that is, basically. The, and then how, I suppose, implicitly it's not particularly queer-friendly either, the idea that you have to marry in a certain way and have children. It's, it's not... You know, that, so, yeah, I wanted to interrogate that in those books. And I do kind of have the kings and queens, but I'm trying to look at how the structures are actually harmful. So. Thank you. John? Yeah, here's a, here's a question that's coming from uh, Kim. And the question is, does the panel believe there is enough disabled queer representation in fantasy and broader literature? If not, how can we get more intersectional representation in fantasy? Is it a case of something that will come as society hopefully becomes more inclusive? Oh, I'm not going to wait for that. <laughs> come on, we've been waiting a million years. Because, I mean, the only answer to that question is to get disabled writers writing. And, you know, uh, we have held them back for years and years and years. And, I mean, I didn't know how to fix that in five minutes, but we've got her somehow. I mean, it feels like it might be, I, I, maybe I shouldn't say this, I can't say it, systemic to how publishing works. It is yeah. a very difficult industry to, uh, barring some exceptions, make a living in, yes. and it is difficult to do if you have chronic ill health. Oh, gosh, yes. Mm. So that, that's something that maybe needs to be addressed on some level. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I can speak um, from the perspective of someone who's chronically ill. Um, so, yes, it, it does not help with deadlines, being chronically ill, I yeah. will say. Um, and I've certainly tried to integrate that into my, again, the Bone Season series, the main character does suffer from chronic pain. And one thing I wanted to do was basically say that you can't always push through chronic pain, because I think that is quite a harmful narrative we see sometimes with disability, the idea that you can <laughs> always overcome pain. And I know I certainly can't in some circumstances, so that's the way I've tried to contribute. But again, we always need more representation, more intersectionality. I don't think we should ever say there's enough. You know, that's you, we should just keep going. Yeah. Um, I think. Can we? Are we allowed to go five minutes over because we started five minutes late? Yeah. <laughs> I love the bargaining. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm afraid to say what colour your hair is, for example, because. <laughs> 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 yes, thank you. Thank you. 
Uh, so this is a question for everybody, uh, since you're all series writers. Do you ever feel like pressure or expectations of fans between like releases or like, oh, they're figuring this out too soon. Do I need to change it or like intimidated by it at all? I don't know how to phrase it, but and also aside, um, which Final Fantasies did you like, Tamsin, when you were younger? <laughs> You know, I'm embarrassed to say how much Final Fantasy X influenced me. Although... And Ten Two, please. Yep. Final Fantasy Ten Two is oh. just as good. I mean, that's the one we just wear little outfits. It's yes, good. I know. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I was talking about this earlier um, with you, Tasha, about the crushing pressure. Mm -hmm. And you know, I'm somebody who brings that from inside the house. You know, I don't even need. You know, I, I try to stay away from fandom as much as possible because, uh, you know, my fans, I think, are having way more fun without me. Um, <laughs> don't need me, you know, except to correct your chunt. Um, <laughs> and it's a case where, you know, I, I think most writers are perfectionists, and at least you want to tell the story right. And I think that as a series, the getting that story right gets harder and harder and harder because, you know, the ending is always the hardest bit for me. Do you find that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I also think that there's um, there's a weird thing that like as a like because we were all readers before we were writers right um, that often a, an author would end a series in a way that I wouldn't have wanted them to but I still enjoyed it maybe I enjoy being mad about it too right um, and I think if you as a writer sit down and you think I need to please everyone you're not going to do it because that's not how books work not every reader is a different person and has different wants and needs mm. And actually, you have to try and let everything go and just write the story that you're trying to tell. But that's easier said than done, unfortunately. Yeah. I mean, as a human being, just saying you're going to disappoint people, I think, is one of the hardest lessons to learn. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I want my, a my star favorite, in books, so. my, my favorite reaction to a series thing was when Stephen King was writing the Dark Tower series. He was finishing up. He was writing the last three books. And in an author's note, at the very end of the seventh book, the seventh and final book, he wrote, look, I don't care if you like the ending or not. It doesn't matter to me. <laughs> that just stuck with me because yeah, the ending King's sucked. <laughs> it, just, it was... I was going to say, of course, it doesn't matter to Stephen King. <laughs> yeah, right. But at the same time, it's so it's so funny to me to, to have this author. He, he's one of my favorite writers of all time. His endings, you know, you could go either way with what you say about how he ends his books. But I loved that idea of Stephen King writing this ending to a series that had been going on for 30 years. And at the very end, he wrote it the way he wanted to write it. And then in his author's note said, I don't care if you get mad about this. Who, who cares? It's a book. Who cares? I and I just, I, I love that idea. It's so fascinating to me. Like, get, get mad, get angry, get upset, get happy or whatever. You're feeling something because you read a book and that made you feel this certain way. And that's the most important thing. It's also what fan fiction is for. Yep. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but also, would you write that author's note if you really didn't care? Is yeah, I know. That does yeah. kind of smack of caring. <laughs> yeah, a little yeah. bit. Yeah. There's a kind of I want to try, uh, maybe I should try now and see if I can get audience, audience, though, mm. Yeah. Do you know who I really appreciate? Just coming back to Stephanie Meyer. <laughs> 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 I need to get over this. Um, but I, you know how angry everyone was when Breaking Dawn? Like, I'm, I, I am going to spoil it. I don't care. You've had years. <laughs> um, so it all builds up to the final battle, and then it doesn't happen. And you know what? As someone who loathes writing battle scenes as an author, I so I actually admire that so much. <laughs> like Stephanie and I was like, you know what? I'm not doing this. And I was like, you know what, Stephanie? I want to do that too. <laughs> um, but yeah, for me, like the, the specific pressure is now that I have two series. And it's interesting because there's the Bone Season girlies and the Priory girlies. <laughs> and what I really need them to do is become one group of girlies. <laughs> and they're still separate. Crossover. Um, so, yeah, so that's kind of stressful because when I'm working on the bone season, people want me to be working on the roots of chaos and then vice versa. So I've been kind of trying to get used to that situation. So, yes, yeah, so if you have read one of my series, I'd love you to read the other one too. <laughs> <laughs> that would really help me. <laughs> yes. Um, what are you wearing? <laughs> wearing lots of planets. Planets. There is a, there is a blinding light, so yeah, I, I can't <laughs> So um, I, I'm, I apologize, this only applies to several of you, but uh, earlier on you guys were talking about fan fiction as an entry into writing, um, and I think I was surprised at how similar my own experience growing up as a queer kid was with like fan fiction being an outlet. And I think um, it, it kind of was an introduction into 
not just writing, but fandom and queerness for a lot of, of young people growing up. Um, and I'm sure that as the world changes, I, we are not in the UK in the total hellscape that it is in the US. Sorry, also American. I sympathize, but so you're Canadian, it's fine. Yeah, I, I could say I could say that. I mean, I'm from pretty close to the border, so we'll go with that. Um, <laughs> but I think there are a lot of positive changes for young queer kids today, where it is much more acceptable to be out. And I guess what I want to know of all of you is what do you guys envision as the the better version of coming into one's queerness and coming into one's creative, whatever it is, if it's not fan fiction, like what, what do you see the next generation of queer authors and queer kids coming of age with and what do you see them having or hope to see them having as their avenue into discovering that? I, I, I'm gonna say I have, I have been given the opportunity to speak with a lot of of young people across the United States. Um, I've been to many schools and and I, I think I've said this before, but the kids today are paying attention. They know what's going on. They, they are angry, they are frightened, and th that's a, that can be a very dangerous combination to people who don't see what they have coming because kids today, they are going to change the world. I wish I wish it didn't have to fall upon their shoulders to do that. I wish it didn't. But much like I wish that there was an entire generation of queer elders above me, but there isn't because they were allowed to be killed off by Reagan in the AIDS crisis. And so when I when I think about what the kids are coming up and what they're going to be doing next, as much as I hate to say it, I think that they're going to be writing and reacting to the way the world is and that they're going to be seeing the people who are targeting them, the people who are trying to come after them, and they are going to they are going to be inspired by that. They are going to be inspired to create visions and worlds of places where people are accepted for who they are, not because of who they love. And I, I don't know um, what that'll look like. I don't know, but I can say this. You know, it's the adage of the kids are going to be all right. It, it, they really are because they are so much more powerful than we give them credit for. And I, I cannot wait to see what they do with the world that we've screwed up. Horrific situations like book banning. I think publishing as a whole is so much friendlier towards queer fiction than it used to be, to the point that when I wrote The Priory of the Orange Tree, I was relatively convinced that it was going to be very niche. Um, and I remember my grandmother, bless her, um, calling me up and saying, um, Samantha, just checking. Actually, going to be interested in a 900 page book about lesbians and dragons. <laughs> and genuinely, I had no idea what the answer was because I, I'd heard kind of anecdotally that lesbian fiction was considered to be very niche at the time and that it was a big risk. But my publisher, Bloomsbury, didn't treat it that way. You know, they didn't pigeonhole it, they treated it exactly as it would be as if it was a straight book in the way that they marketed it, the way that they, they didn't think that it was going to be something that only a small number of people read. They pushed it like it was going to be read by a lot of people, and it was. So the fact that, I mean, I just found out last year that the Priory of the Orange Series had sold a million copies, yeah. and that's, it's what? I hate it. <laughs> Genre. That, that was such I, I would never have thought that before and it is like a, for all the the terrible things that are going on in the world and all of the backlash I'm so glad that publishing is where it is and I think it has been moving in a positive direction so I just hope that the next generation of authors find it even easier and I feel very privileged that the way that I got to come out was by writing a novel about lesbians and dragons <laughs> yeah iconic <laughs> Um, I think that's probably all we've got time for, sadly. Um, but what a wonderful note to end on. That is a wonderful thing to be able to celebrate. Um, and, you know, I'm sure you all know Gay's the Word. Yeah, brilliant. <laughs> um, I, yeah, I've known the Gay's the Word team for a while, and I popped in there uh, a few weeks ago, and they were just talking about how overwhelmed they are, in a good way, because so much new queer work is being published all the time. And you were sort of talking about the sort of maybe slight sort of dearth of lesbian fiction previously. 
you look at the lesbian section in Gays of the World now, you, look, you see all the major publishers are, are represented. They're all publishing lesbian fiction, young adult fiction, trans fiction, non-binary fiction. I mean, it's a tiny shop and they have to have sections for everything because kids are coming in with their parents sometimes. I mean, can you imagine that happening 20 years ago? Nope. Um, to pick out, uh, you know, a book that helps them to see themselves represented. Uh, and that is a wonderful thing. So um, all stories are valid, all writing is valid. Keep writing, keep buying books. Buy a few more of mine because <laughs> <laughs> these people are all doing exceptionally well. <laughs> um, so I would like to ask you to join me in thanking Tamsin Muir. TJ Clue. <laughs> Tasha Suri. <laughs> and Samantha Shannon. And Mendes. <laughs>